First lesson this morning, our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Ezekiel, beginning at the 34th chapter and the 11th verse. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed I myself will search for you, for my sheep, and seek them out. And as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. And I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Our second reading, our epistle lesson this morning comes from the book of First Peter starting at chapter 2 and beginning at verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, but who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This morning's gospel comes from the book of John, beginning at the 10th chapter and the 11th verse. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Well, it's probably not a surprise that many religions of the world use the theme of a shepherd. Now, perhaps if you attended worship service here last year on this Good Shepherd Sunday, you might remember me mentioning that the ancient Greeks believed in a god named Hermes, who was the messenger of the Greek god Zeus, the head god. And sometimes Hermes was, was portrayed in sculptures and artwork as carrying a sheep around his neck, withholding all four of its legs. And when Hermes was portrayed in this fashion, he was called the Creophoros, meaning the ram bearer. And the story of the ram bearer is, of, of course, being of Greek mythology of ancient days. Now, the most ancient civilization, going far back before Greeks and Roman times, that we know that it has produced writing that we can still find, is called the Sumerian culture. And one of the earliest pieces of the Sumerian literature that we know of to have existed was a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And this is very ancient. Scholars estimate that this was written maybe like 2100 B.C., way back. And one of the gods that we read about in the Epic of Gilgamesh is a deity named Demuzid. And Demuzid was said to be a shepherd too, just like Hermes, the Creophoros. And Demuzid was the god of shepherds of, you know, of animal husbandry, of raising livestock. And Demuzid competed with another god named Enkimdu. And Enkimdu was the god of agriculture. The livestock god and the crop god 
were competing for the hand of the goddess named Inanna. And at first, Inanna wanted to marry the one who tended the crops. But for whatever reason, her brother convinces her to choose the shepherd instead of the one who tended the fields. Now, while Inanna was first pleased with her choice of mate, she eventually, there are gaps in the story because we haven't found all of the story, but somehow she ends up going down to the underworld because she wants to challenge her sister to have the right to rule down there. And even though she's not dead yet, she goes to the underworld, but instead of overtaking the abode of the dead, she is stuck there. They say that she can't leave. And they say she can only leave unless she finds someone to replace her. So she searched all around the earth trying to find who would be a good substitute for her in the underworld. And she couldn't find a suitable person because everybody was mourning for her. But then she comes to her husband. And her husband, the shepherd, was not mourning for her at all. But he was sitting on her throne and dressed in regal robes. And she sees this and is all disgusted. So she says, he will be the one who will substitute for me. Somehow it ends up that he ends up having to stay down there for half of the year, and that's the winter, and then his sister has to be down there for the other half of the year, spring, so he can come back and, I guess, give fertility to the earth or something like that. Now, the shepherd god idea endured, not only through Sumerian culture, which was Iraq, the Tigris, and the Euphrates rivers, but another civilization rose up after the Sumerians had faded away, and this one was the Babylonian culture. That's a name that we're more familiar with. And the Babylonian culture also retained this idea of this shepherd god. But the Babylonian civilization did not preserve the name. They didn't call him Jamuzid any longer. They called him Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z. And so widespread was the shepherd god figure that even in the Jewish calendar, there is a month called Tammuz, which falls in June, July. And just like, you know, our calendar has pagan names to it, the Sunday, the day of the sun, Monday, the day of the moon, Thursday, Thor's day. So the Jewish calendar also had absorbed this because it was part of the culture. And the worship of Tammuz is even mentioned in the scriptures. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 4, the prophet Ezekiel has a vision of these women weeping for Tammuz. This was the, the way that his devotion was practiced is that you know when he would be leaving the earth now to go down for the six month of the cold part of the year that the women would weep for him and so ezekiel has this vision of this and obviously this did not please ezekiel nor did it of course please the lord now ezekiel was a prophet who spoke in captivity in babylon now the jews in babylon some of them picked up on this idea of tammuz and that's what this vision was getting at at the beginning of chapter 34 in our Old Testament lesson for today, beginning at verse 11, Ezekiel speaks out about all kinds of false prophets. It says here that they were false prophets. And what did Ezekiel call these false prophets? But false shepherds. False shepherds. Verse 12 of chapter 34. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day, he is among his scattered sheep. So will I seek out my shepherd and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. So God promises deliverance to his people even though they have fallen into such idolatry and paganism. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, also makes a similar point of lamenting that the people had fallen into this false religion, but that God would send a new shepherd who would deliver them from their bondage, to bring them back to himself. Now you see the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise in Ezekiel by seeing the life of Jesus Christ. Now in the New Testament, in John chapter 10, we heard Jesus' words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The appearances of the good shepherd in Israel was, or I should say the appearance, the coming, the advent of Jesus, born as a baby in Bethlehem, his arrival signaled a new season in itself, did it not? This was a, a huge change, was it not? And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those religious teachers and leaders of the day, they felt threatened by this arrival because they knew it was 
they knew it was like an existential threat. They knew that their, their power and their prestige were being challenged. But the religious establishment was not the only one that was experiencing a type of uh, new paradigm. Because as Jesus' ministry blossomed and flourished, the full extent of his ministry began to unfold even for his disciples as well, even for his inner core. They began to see, although dimly a lot of times, that there was something great and grand and expanding about his ministry. Perhaps you remember the account of Jesus meeting a woman who was from the region of the cities of Tyre and Sidon. We preached on that, I don't know, maybe it was like a month or so ago. And in the Gospel of Matthew, she's called a Canaanite woman. And in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, she is identified as a Syrophoenician woman in chapter 15. And both identities basically mean the same thing. But the most important part of her identity is that she is a Gentile. She is not a Jew. And this woman was seeking help for her daughter who was possessed by some type of evil power, if I remember correctly. So here she is from the north country, not far from Israel, but from Lebanon, the present-day Lebanon. And this desperate woman pled with Jesus to deliver her daughter. And at first, Jesus doesn't even appear to be like taken in by her story at all. It's almost like he's ignoring her. She asks for his help, and he responds, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. It is not fair to take from the master's table and give it to the dogs. And you may remember what the woman said, even though she was kind of uh, being insulted almost. I don't know if say Jesus, you know, but there was, the, it was, there was not ambiguity there that Jesus did not seem interested at first. But then she has faith. She responds in great faith, one of the greatest displays of faith in the whole scripture, when she says, but master, even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from his table. The crumbs that fall from the master's table. And so we see that Jesus' ministry is expanding even in his own travel, that the, the Gentiles are being brought in, that there's something new, that yes, he came for the house of Israel, but that wasn't the end. We hear a widening and a deepening of Christ's ministry in our scripture in John chapter 10 today as well. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he proclaimed, and there are other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring in, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. So who are these other sheep to whom Jesus was referring? Now when Jesus declared that he's the good shepherd, he was speaking this to the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And they always disliked Jesus because it just didn't fit their box at all. You know, he was, they saw themselves as faithfully carrying on the tradition of Moses. And it was while Moses was in Midian, when the Lord appeared to him, and what was Moses doing? What was his job when God came to him in the burning bush and said, I am who I am? He was a shepherd. But they didn't realize that the law that Moses received finally in his call is with the Ten Commandments uh, was going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They didn't realize that Israel had been chosen to be God's people, not only for their own sake, but for the sake of the world. And therefore, God had not only come in Jesus Christ for the lost sheep of Israel, but that we see that that benefit and that blessing was going to be upon his disciples, that he was going to commission them, as we read in the end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, that he was going to send them to faraway places. And so the gospel message was preached not only to Judea and not only to Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. And last week we thought about this too as we reflected on the ministry of the Apostle Thomas and how he traveled 3,000 miles to preach the gospel in India, to a place where he knew not the language nor the customs or anything. This verse that we're focusing on about the lost sheep, I have other sheep I need to bring in that are not of my flock, has been a verse that's captured people's attention over the years. It is a favorite scripture of the Mormons. The Latter-day Saints teach that when Jesus said that there are sheep of another fold that I need to bring in, that he was referring to his trip that he was going to take to the Americas and to preach the gospel on this hemisphere. Now, unlike the Mormons, we see no evidence whatsoever of that ha happening. We see no evidence of that. But we think of the American context as we examine this story today. And we are still glad that Jesus commissioned his disciples to carry the gospel in many ways 
didn't come by, by the Book of Mormon's uh, testimony, but it came because Jesus' uh, disciples went to many different places over hundreds and, and thousands of years. And so we are included in that too. For most of us here this morning, I assume almost all of us here are Gentiles, that we have been grafted in, as the scriptures say. And so we thank God that his son's ministry expanded to include even us. But Jesus is a better shepherd, not just because his message happens to be more inclusive. Jesus is a better shepherd because he's a better shepherd than any other shepherd there ever has been, nor ever will be. The people that surrounded Israel willingly abandoned worshiping their pagan deities. People do not worship Zeus. Um, I'm sure there are some that still do, but it's a minority. People do not worship Tammuz. But people have set that aside. The world has set that aside because we see the superiority of Jesus Christ as the great and true shepherd. The neighboring shepherds of Israel, these stories, these myths of ancient days, they pale in comparison to the true shepherd of the Old and New Testament. Now the Greek Hermes Kreophoros was said to have saved the Greek city of Tanagra from plague by carrying a ram all around the boundaries of the city to ward off a disease. That was, you know, would have been considered a good thing. But he was also an opportunistic shepherd. And he was a cattle rustler, it is said. And then, of course, we think of Tammuz. Again, we already heard about how he had deceived his wife. He was, he was a usurper of the throne. See, these are the kind of shepherds that people thought of as being who God is. And they were opportunists. Yes, they were said to do good things, but they also were just like human beings, and they were sinners too. They both were said to tend sheep, but they also would fit that category of false prophets, just like Ezekiel and Jeremiah warned. See, Jesus warned about false shepherds who come to seek and destroy. And he was not also, he was, excuse me, he was not referring just to things in the past of ancient history, but he was, he refers also to the many dangers that our church continues to face, that the church has always faced in its 2,000 years. And Jesus, like Tammuz, he descends to the underworld, he descended, but not for six months, for three days. And he rose from the grave. And that's way better than simply hoping for him to come back in the spring. We hear Jesus' words, chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, that same one is a thief and a robber. And Jesus also said, a hireling sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep, and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. See, that's what the, the mythological kinds of gods would do. They were just opportunists. If it was good for them, they'd do it. If it helped out their cause, they would do it. But this is not how our shepherd is like. You and I, we do not need a shepherd that is only part-time. We have too many problems in our lives. We have too much sin in our lives that we need a full-time shepherd 24 hours a day a god who is only around for half of the year is not good enough for all our troubles you want a shepherd whose skin and whose whole body are in the game we want one who is risen from the dead who blazes the way for us so that we can join him in eternity in verse 17 jesus said about himself i lay down my life for the sheep I have the power to lay down my life, and I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. That is quite a different story than being banished to the underworld for six months. You and I, we needed a shepherd who is invested and who is powerful and who looks out for your safety, looks out for your interest. Like Jesus, he endured torture in seeking to lead you to eternal life. He endured the grave so that you would not be forever stuck in the grave. You need a shepherd who protects you from the dangers of the world, both physical and spiritual. Now, there are plenty of people out there, plenty of false shepherds, and even those who claim no religiosity who would seek to kill and destroy or take advantage of you in your circumstances, whatever they may be. It is well known 
In the same way, too, that, that's why Jesus used sheep, because sheep are easily vulnerable to predators. They wander away from the flock and become lost. They're easily exposed, and so they need a shepherd to care for them, to watch over them, to guide each one of their footsteps. And when trouble comes, when danger arrives, that they need one to come and rescue them. And that is the kind of shepherd that you need. That's the kind of shepherd that I need. You need a shepherd that not only keeps you safe, but also meets you in your needs and problems. And Christ is that shepherd who meets you where you are because he knows your name. He knows who you are. You belong to him. He claims you as his own. As Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my father's hands. See, Jesus really does care for you. He died for you. As Matthew 18 and Luke 15 tell us, the good shepherd leaves the flock of the 99 to look for the one that has gone astray. What a relief it is to have a shepherd who knows you by name and who tenderly cares for you in your moment and in your season of struggle. Now for a few of you among this flock who are gathered here today, this week has been one of the worst weeks of your life. And it's been challenging you to the core, physically, emotionally. It's been tough. How can life seem to be going just fine? And then at one moment later, everything changes in the twinkling of an eye. Now, others of you who maybe had a really good week, maybe this is one of the best weeks you've ever had in your life, but you can think of a different week that you've had it pretty rough. You can think of some week that you were walking straight through the valley of the shadow of death, as uh, we think about today in Psalm 23. So remember that you are not a passing thought to God, that God is not some distant creator who has created life eons ago and set the world spinning without caring what's going on in its events or with your personal life. He can name both your blessings and your burdens. As Psalm 23 says, it uses individualized language. It speaks to you in the second person, as the grammarians would say. It's not, the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want, he makes the sheep lie down in green pastures. Those are not the words of the 23rd Psalm. What does the text say? What do the scriptures say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. It is indeed a blessing to have a personal shepherd that you need not fear evil because he is with you each and every step of the way. As we, For thou art with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So stay near to the shepherd. Be in earshot of the shepherd so that you can hear his voice, that you follow him just like sheep recognize the voice of their master. Keep yourself close, and when you wander, let the shepherd's staff gently pull you back to safety and to his loving care. And whatever is going on in your life, or has been going on this week, or will be going on next year, or will be going on 10 years from now, whatever problem that you are facing, remember that God is right there with you in your problems he knows your concern he knows your need he knows your problems he became a human being and suffered all the bad things that we experience plus more so he knows your burden and so lay it on him continue to cast your cares on him today and evermore